So I just woke up after spending eight hours binging the entire first season of Netflix's adaptation of Avatar The Last Airbender and... What I feel inside is a mix of apathy, joy, and confusion, but not at any one thing, and not at the same time. Unlike the M. Night movie, there isn't a whole lot of egregious things to point out. There's no group of earthbenders trying to bend a single rock here. Instead, there's a mix of middling quality with regards to the writing, the performances, the choreography, and the visual effects, and the show ultimately leaves me largely hollow and perplexed. But when I say middling, I don't mean it in a consistent way. It's not as though the show is perfectly mediocre throughout. It's more like when you microwave a burrito and you take a bite. That first bite is great and promises to be delicious. That basically describes the first two episodes, which start off on a strong foot and I was on for the ride. I was ready for my third and fourth bite. But once episode three and four came around, there was this nagging trouble in the back of my head that didn't quite show itself. A whisper that something was off. In the same way that when you're eating a microwave burrito and the center can be unevenly cooked. And it wasn't until episode five where that whisper became a shout and my excitement for the show greatly diminished. That's right, we've gotten to the frozen middle of the burrito. But even during that time, there are hints of spices that wow, that let me know that this thing can still be delicious. And that's where episode six comes in, back to the more evenly cooked part of the burrito. The bite that could very nearly save it all with the blue spirit and the Zuko backstory episode it being one of my favorite episodes, right up there with episode one and two. And funny enough, episode one and six, uh, those are the ones that were originally written by the original creators before they left. So there's some food for thought for you. And once we get to episode seven and eight, which has some thrilling moments, but doesn't quite stick the landing to make up for the middle episodes that left me wanting. And then I'm sitting there, staring at this burrito analogy, wondering why I went to a microwave burrito to begin with. Why didn't I just go for a properly cooked burrito in the first place? The animated show. Okay, no more talk of microwave burritos. That all said, I don't believe this was a disaster, not even close to it. Yet because of this imbalance, it's almost more troubling. At least with the original movie, I can dismiss it whole cloth. I can't quite do the same thing to this Netflix show, not where there is so much to love about it as well. There's still enough foundation here to catapult this into a book two and book three with far less issues. And the show can go from middling to very good or great with more consistency across the board. The problem now is whether or not Netflix has the belief in the show as well, especially as the show hovers between rotten and fresh over on Rotten Tomatoes and a lukewarm audience score. And I can't underscore this enough, how much of a mixed bag this show really is. It's not just as simple as love and hate. It's a melting pot of ingredients that should be a hearty meal, but add up to something slightly off. Like it's missing some salt or that secret sauce. First off, setting expectations here is like trying to hit a bullseye in the middle of an earthquake. On one note, we've got the legendary animated series that's basically untouchable, and on the other, well, there's that movie which set the bar so low a snail could trip over it. So where does Netflix's attempt tend to land? Somewhere in the middle, if not perhaps a few notches above middling when all things are said and done, which unfortunately was below my expectations, especially after that brilliant first episode. To my delight, this isn't a straight up copy and paste job from Netflix. It's more like when you ask a friend to copy their homework and then they tell you to change it up a bit so it's not so obvious. The essence is the same. We've got our bending, our avatar, the quest to save the world from the Fire Nation, but how they go about it has been shuffled around and remixed, adding some new twists and expanding on things in a way that the original didn't. For starters, we see a lot more of the Fire Nation politics early on, with characters like Fire Lord Ozai and Princess Azula popping up sooner than expected. And while initially I was on board for these additions, by the final credits of the final episode, I don't know if we gain enough from these new insights to make their early inclusion worth it. True, it's clear that we're setting up for more to come, assuming Netflix keeps the show going. But while some of these additions are mm, kind of cool, giving us a deeper dive into the world, not all the changes hit the mark. Some parts feel rushed, cramming too much into each episode, while other bits drag and have unnecessary complexity. It's like they're trying to attract the Game of Thrones crowd with more lore and darker themes, which yeah, isn't always a perfect fit, but when it does hit really well, it does hit. 
Some of the new imagining of the lore was so drastic and so cold though, I actively disliked what was going on as I was watching it, such as episode 5, this Spirited Away episode, which completely reset the rules of some of the spirits. What's more, I felt like the characters went on the same arcs over and over. When we should have been paving new ground, we go back to the same well. As though the writers weren't sure how to navigate this remix they concocted. And a lot of the plot lines and expansion felt like the writers didn't trust the pasting and natural progression of the original story. A lot of the reveals that were supposed to happen in book 2 and 3 are dropped right in book 1, making me wonder where they're going to be going after this. And that happens far too often. This becomes more baffling when certain plot lines were axed for no apparent reason. Character wise, it's a roller coaster, though I would say that the roller coaster isn't so sharp that there are equal parts of highs and lows. None of my issues come from the performances themselves. All the actors do well here, or at least do as well as they could with the material that they have been given. My only issue with some of these characters come by way of their characterization and what they get to do. Zuko, spot on. The angst, the internal struggle, it's all there. He's easily the best of the bunch, and when the show feels like it's about him, it's at its best. King Boomy, extremely bizarre. I don't even know if the writers know what they wanted to do with that character, and he suffers the greatest in terms of his changed core values. Sokka's humor and depth get some decent screen time too, which I appreciated, but his romantic subplot somehow feel more rushed than what we got in the show, which was already rushed to begin with. There just isn't enough time to believe he's created these strong bonds with these lovers he seems to acquire from city to city. Not to mention, it feels like Sokka goes on the same arc three times in the season, which doesn't help. Still, Ian Ousley's depiction of Sokka shines through despite all of that. And Aang and Katara, they're kind of flattened out, missing out on some of the nuance that made them so relatable and fun in the animated series. Neither Gordon Cormier nor Giao Indio give poor performances. It's not an issue of their line delivery. It's just that their characters aren't given enough to feel 100% dynamic. There are hints though, through the veil of who they can be, but once I reflect back on it, it's all just a bit, once again, off. The greatest crime, however, is how often the group is split up during those middle episodes. When Team Avatar was supposed to come together and grow closer to one another, instead, they are having all these adventures on their own. So when it's time for them to join forces in the inn, it doesn't feel quite earned. Visually, the show is a treat. The locations, the bending, mostly, it's got some seriously cool moments. But then you hit some awkward spots where the bending feels off or the background looks like a fancy wallpaper. It feels like there were drastically different visual effects companies working from shot to shot. And let's not even get into how some of the fight scenes play out. It's like they couldn't decide whether they want to be a martial arts showcase or a CGI fest. And some of the action directing left quite a bit to be desired. The choreography was there for the most part, but the way some of that choreography was shot and staged did not serve it as best as it could be. So, is it worth a watch? If you're a hardcore Avatar fan, you'll probably want to check it out if only to satisfy your curiosity. But go in with moderate expectations. It's not going to replace the animated series in your heart, but it's not a total train wreck either. It's just fine, but kind of? And in a world where we've seen how bad it can get, fine is sometimes just good enough. I just wish that the show could have stuck its landing a little better. It definitely lands in the end, but it does so with a stumble and a wobble, leaving it at a score for me of 6.5 out of 10 when all things are said and done, between the space of fine and good. A net positive experience overall, but man, was that a mixed bag if I ever saw one. I'm sure I'll have more thoughts and I'll do a lot more unpacking over the coming weeks and months and probably years. Don't forget to catch my After You Watch stream this weekend so we can all discuss this together about what we thought of the show. Until then, let me know what you thought of the show in the comments below. Was it a mixed bag for you as well? Do you have a more clear view of the show, thinking it's wholly brilliant or wholly terrible? Let me know in the comments below and check out this video on screen if you're a fan of Avatar. I'll catch you on the next one and as always, peace, love. And remember, be water, my friends.